Exploring the moon is incredibly exciting. Think about it. Different countries are sending their spacecraft up there to find out new things. We're talking about real-life space adventures. But things are not always easy. Russia's Suez MS-10 spacecraft faced serious problems during its launch to the International Space Station, or ISS, from Kazakhstan. As the world watched in anticipation, the Suez MS-10 booster was set to carry a crew to the ISS. However, this ambitious journey turned into a heart-stopping moment when the booster suddenly exploded. The incident highlighted the immense challenges and risks that space travel still presents, even with our advanced technology. Imagine the tension in the control room as this unexpected event unfolded. In a matter of mere seconds, the excitement turned into concern, reminding us that the quest to conquer the cosmos is as daring as it is unpredictable. It reminds us that space is still a big mystery and has lots of dangers. In today's episode, we're going to hear some of the spookiest stuff that NASA astronauts have talked about. Want to know what made them shiver in space? Well, get ready to dive into their weird stories. Astronauts have had terrifying things happen to them while in space. Are these workplace conspiracies or actual experiences? Something shiny on the moon. NASA astronaut Alan Bean claims he saw something shiny on the moon. He described it as shoe leather. While you expect space to be black and devoid of light in places, what was this shiny thing he saw? Could it have been glass? Whatever the reason for what he saw, there's not much of an explanation for this one. Speaking of shiny objects and light, we will also tell you another story. American astronaut Leroy Chiao, commander of the International Space Station in 2005, along with his crew, saw a set of strange lights in space. Chiao described the formation as an upside-down, almost V. The crew and Chiao chanced upon the formation after it flew past them. Strange space music. During the Apollo 10 mission, a test run for the first mission to the moon, astronauts, among other things, took to testing various equipment. The stakes were high since this was not a simulation but real space-time. Much to the surprise of these astronauts, they heard a strange sort of whistling on their headphones that they later described as space music. Space Snake Retired NASA astronaut Dr. Story Musgrave has a lot to his credit, so it would be difficult to pass this off as a lie, but he claims he saw an eight-foot-long white snake floating through space. It's not hard to imagine that this could have been a hose detached from the spaceship, but Musgrave remains adamant. It was a space snake. The Knock First off, listen, there's no sound in space. There's only vacuum. And this is precisely what makes this story strange. Back in 2003, astronaut Yang Liwei, the first to be sent into space by the Chinese space program, was sitting in his space shuttle when he reportedly heard a knock. He described it as someone knocking the body of the spaceship, just as knocking an iron bucket with a wooden hammer. Apparently, he's not the only one to have experienced this. There were other Chinese astronauts between 2005 and 2008 who had reported hearing similar sounds. They're on the moon watching us. When astronaut Neil Armstrong took a walk on the moon and became the first man to do so, what followed was an onslaught of conspiracy theories. For one, his historic stroll on the moon is claimed to have been shot in a studio. 
of the many conspiracy theories surrounding this moment, there's one that remains a mystery to date. During the Apollo 11 mission in 1969, after Armstrong landed on the moon, NASA claims to have lost transmission for roughly two minutes. And in reportedly a secret message to NASA, he said, These babies were huge, sir. Enormous. Oh God, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecrafts out here, lined up on the far side of the crater's edge. They're on the moon watching us. Two Minutes of Silence In his 1975 book, Our Cosmic Ancestors, former chief of NASA communication systems, Murray Chatteling, stated that the two UFOs were hovering above Armstrong just before he descended later to land on the moon. Edwin Aldrin captured them in a number of photos. In the modern People magazine edition from June 1975, several of these photos were featured. According to reports, the first two minutes after Armstrong set foot on the moon were silent because the transmission failed due to an arbitrary overheating issue. However, it was purportedly said, These babies were huge, sir, enormous. Oh God, you wouldn't believe it, I'm telling you. There are other spacecraft out here, lined up on the far side of the crater's edge. They're on the moon watching us. UFO Sign when we think UFOs, we think disc shape or flying saucers. Anything beyond our understanding is pretty much difficult to explain, as astronauts James McDivitt and Ed White came to realize. This happened when they were flying over Hawaii. They noticed a flying object that to them didn't seem like something from Earth at all, but this metallic object seemed to have arms sticking out of its body. What was this object, and why did it have arms? We'll hopefully know soon enough. This one will make sense, considering that the first test subjects to make it to space were a monkey and a dog. And when a seemingly good thing turned into failure, these animal corpses were launched into space, where they reportedly float to this day, and can be seen by astronauts making trips to space. While it's sad, the scene can seem a bit creepy too. Just imagine, animal corpses floating around against the backdrop of a black and infinite space, and you have to just go on doing what you came to do. You've probably seen a lot of stories detailing astronaut Scott Kelly's arduous journey as he got ready to spend a long, long time on the International Space Station. He went on to become an astronaut who spent the most hours there. But that's not the only thing that makes his story stand out. Kelly has said things that suggest a big brush with aliens. While he's not said so himself in so many words, his jokes seem less like jokes and more like something for all humanity to consider. Like the time he mentioned in an interview, he spoke about aliens having it easier in space than we do. What's worse than spotting one UFO? Well, a fleet of UFOs. There's just something about the scene that doesn't exactly lend it an aura of complete innocence. Astronaut Gordon Cooper, the astronaut who flew both the Mercury 9 and the Gemini 5, claims to have seen an entire fleet of UFOs around the time he flew for the Air Force. Unknown to him, ten years later, he'd chance upon a similar scene. Reportedly in 1963, one such object flew towards him. It was picked up on the radar too, which answers any questions about proof of its existence. Coming back to our idea of what a UFO should look like. Well, no one should expect it to be cylindrical. In 1991, cosmonaut Musa Manarov apparently caught this cylindrical UFO on film. The shiny object seems to be swiveling and making it across space. Watch the video and decide for yourself what the object might be. Spacenik Dr. Story Musgrave, a retired NASA astronaut, made a lot of progress during his time in space. Dr. Musgrave is the most academically qualified astronaut, having earned six academic degrees and the only astronaut to have flown on six space missions. 
He is the only astronaut to have traveled on board each of the five space shuttles. Naturally, Dr. Musgrave's word carries a lot of weight and authority given his expertise and education. It would be challenging to prove that he was lying when he said he saw an eight-foot-long white serpent floating through space. Musgrave is adamant, though. Despite it being easy to think that this could have been a hose that broke free from the spacecraft, he claims that on not just one, but two of his space journeys, he saw the six to eight foot long eel or serpent-like creature. Dr. Musgrave has asserted in numerous interviews that there is alien life and that he has seen it. Risking electrocution and a suit fire. That time Scott Parazinski had to venture further away from the ISS airlock than anyone ever had before while risking electrocution and a suit fire in order to save some important solar panels. Scott Parazinski had to perform some hero-level spacewalking when a jammed solar panel threatened the safety of the entire ISS, or again International Space Station, crew and the ISS itself. The main mission, objective, was to install a new module on the ISS that would serve as a node for the addition of future research laboratories. Part of the mission required changing the location of an array of solar panels. Things were going along really, really well, Parazinski told BuzzFeed Science, until the crew inside commanded these large solar panels to extend. Well, they got jammed up and the panels began to tear. Perzanski said, It was unsafe to continue to extend this panel any further. You couldn't retract it either. There was concern, he said, that if we even tried to undock the space shuttle, it might rip apart and hit the shuttle, and we could have had another Space Shuttle Columbia disaster on our hands. Or we could damage the International Space Station and have everyone evacuate. It could actually electrocute me or cause ignition of the 100% oxygen in my spacesuit, he said. After 72 hours of grueling work on the ground, NASA came up with a plan. Parazinski would have to travel further away from the safety of an airlock than had ever previously been attempted. It wasn't only the distance that was nerve-wracking, Parazinski explained. Quote, there was a real danger that we could do even worse damage to the space station. Then, there was the potential of risk to myself, because if there was any metal-to-metal -metal connection with the solar panel or arcing, it could actually electrocute me or cause ignition of the 100% oxygen in my spacesuit. All the tools that I was working with had to be specifically insulated. The metal parts of my spacesuit had to be wrapped in special tape, he said. Thankfully, everything worked out and the mission was a complete success. I still to this day think it's one of NASA's greatest accomplishments, Parazinski said. The worst fire ever. Jerry Lininger was in the middle of an extended stay on the Mir space station when a catastrophic fire threatened what was then meant to be the longest period of time of any American astronaut sent into space. The station normally held three astronauts at a time, Lininger told BuzzFeed Science unless the crew was in the middle of switching personnel over, when two crews would be in the station at the same time. With six astronauts on board the station, the amount of oxygen produced by the regular tanks was sometimes not sufficient enough, and in those cases, the crew needed to open up a supplemental tank. Things went from jovial to terrible in a split second, when the tank of concentrated combustible, oxygen-based chemicals caught fire and turned into what can only be described as a huge, unstoppable blowtorch. I was sucking down some dehydrated borscht, Lindiger said, and next thing, you've got the master alarm blaring. This was pretty much a worst case scenario for the astronauts and cosmonauts on Mir. There are three things that you are on your own for, Lindiger said. You better respond more or less automatically to them because there's no one that can help you. Those things are fire, check, 
Toxic substances in the air, from a super hot flame burning through equipment, check, and rapid decompression, which would almost certainly happen if the flame burned a hole through the thin aluminum separating the inside from the vacuum of space. It was a hot, hot, hot fire burning out of control. The fire blazed for 14 minutes, as Leninger and his crew made sure that secondary fires didn't catch by dousing things in its path with fire extinguishers. The flame ate up the chemical, melted the canister, melted the insulation, our wires for example, around that area, Leninger said. It was a hot, hot, hot fire burning out of control, he said. As three astronauts were fighting the blaze, the other three crew members were preparing a Suyas for an emergency escape. But there was a problem. One of the two Suya ships was blocked by the fire, so only three of the six would be able to escape Mir. That would have been a tough decision, Leninger said when striking nonchalance. Who goes and who stays? Luckily for the crew, that tough decision never had to be made. We were able to finally keep it from spreading, Linegar said, and then we faced the problem of trying to deal with the smoke and trying to breathe in a contaminated atmosphere. The team assessed the damage and wore oxygen masks until they were sure the environmental risks were gone. You've got to get rid of the distractions, put the fear away, and you sort of realize, if I don't stay calm, I'm dead. Sensors failed moments before high-precision docking. During Chris Hadfield's first flight, he and his fellow astronauts had to navigate a quarter million pound shuttle toward a target the size of a coffee cup saucer on the Russian Mir space station. Hadfield's job was to relay the speed and range information to the pilot as they were docking. This was super important because the docking was an extremely high precision event. They had a two minute window to dock and they had to be traveling a tenth of a foot per second plus or minus three one-hundredths of a second. Failure to do so would be catastrophic. If you hit the mirror just a little too soft, Hadfield said, then the spring mechanisms would bounce you off, he explained. If you hit mirror just a little too hard, then you would break mirror in half and kill the three people on board. So you've got to hit it exactly right. If the crew on board the flight deck of the shuttle don't solve this problem in the next 30 seconds, then the whole flight is bust and done. When the crew was about 30 feet away, the two sensors started telling them different things. One of them told us we were at 32 feet, and the other one told us we were at 20 feet, Hadfield said. They're either both wrong, or one of them is completely wrong, and the other one is completely right. Now what do you do? There's nobody to ask. If the crew on board the flight deck of the shuttle don't solve this problem in the next 30 seconds, then the whole flight is bust and done. Chris Hadfield said he went back to basics. He knew the docking module's dimensions, and he used his thumb to eyeball the distance through a window. This told him that they were about 21 feet away and not 32 feet away. He used his stopwatch to do the math to figure out how fast they were going and when they should fire thrusters. They ended up being spot on, hitting the docking target at the correct speed and well within the time envelope. Covered in toxic ammonia during a spacewalk. Bob Kerbeam was no stranger to spacewalking when he was installing upgrades to the International Space Station. Still, he wasn't expecting a cooling line to break and spew toxic ammonia all over his suit. A spacecraft is a closed system meaning that the only air you have to work with is the air that you brought in with you. That means an astronaut better be damn sure they are not bringing anything toxic back into the air with them. First, Curebeam had to stop the leak. Then he had to figure out how he was going to get back into the space shuttle without bringing in the volatile ammonia contaminating his spacesuit. Curebeam handled the leak with no problems. Even though we were doing things on the fly, we understood the hardware and the system and how it works so well, he said. The training is so good that even if you're doing it on the fly and making it up as you go along, you can make it up in a smart way, he said. He baked himself in sunlight for an extra 30 minutes, 
arguably one of the most surreal and terrifying sunbathing methods a human can experience. Then, next problem was contamination. Some good old-fashioned science helped with that one. Ammonia has a low boiling point, so he just needed to vaporize it off his suit. To do this, he simply baked himself in sunlight for an extra 30 minutes. Arguably, one of the most surreal and terrifying sunbathing methods a human can experience. Later, a fellow astronaut brushed off the suit and equipment. To be doubly sure, they partially vented the shuttle airlock. Next, to be even more careful, the shuttle crew all wore oxygen masks inside until they were positive nothing had made its way in. It was just a totally different moon than I had grown up with. At first, liftoff was slow and smooth. Surprisingly so, given the explosion happening more than 300 feet below him at the business end of the Saturn V rocket. Blasting off to the moon was like a car drifting forward when taking your foot off the brake, said Al Warden, who flew on Apollo 15 in 1971. Then the rumbling began, though not nearly as violent as he expected. Charlie Duke, who flew on Apollo 16, had a different experience. The rattling was so intense, he wondered, is this thing working right? Is it supposed to shake this hard, he thought? Nearly three decades later, Dorothy Metcalf Lindenberger had the same sensation, but on a different rocket. Flying on Space Shuttle Discovery, she felt, quote, the biggest kick in the back I have ever felt. I didn't play football or anything. I don't know if there's anything equivalent here. But it's intense, and then all of a sudden everything is shaking. You're shaking. The vehicle is shaking. Our commander was like, wow, it's like a lot of energy. And our pilot was like, yeah, it's really something. And I was like, um, it's crazy. Let's put some perspective on this. For former NASA astronaut Nicole Stott, the math of the shuttle liftoff, applying 7 million pounds of thrust to get the 4.5 million pound rocket off the pad and then accelerate it to 24 times the speed of sound in just eight and a half minutes, added up to an experience that made her whole body feel like it was ready for marshmallows and a mold. It was like jello inside, she said. There's plenty of these astronauts to talk about, and every instance is legit creepy. How much of it is true, though, has yet to be established. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys in the next video.